All right. So, um, okay, I'm going to start uh, sharing the screen now. Um, you're going to start. All right, people, today we are going to introduce the, the shell model. Um, but before that, we're going to go, uh, we're going to take a detour and I will explain a little bit more in a sec. So first of all, I have the solutions of the test one here in this video in Canva, where you can actually um, go and see, it's basically like a, a rubric on see how, how you, you can get all the marks and how to do the test according to our standards, right? In the nuclear shell model, I, in that tab, I already added the lecture notes in PDF. And, <clears throat> and we'll add the videos from today and the next few days. In, the, in tomorrow, the tutorial, the, I will do the tutorial myself. And uh, tomorrow we have, are going to have, we're going to have a long day. And we're going to investigate uh, the nuclear shell model in detail. <clears throat> But we will, before we proceed, here we go. Uh, here we go. Can you hear me? Sorry, there was a, he was not connected for a sec. Can you hear me guys? Come on. Uh, yes, okay. Good, thanks Tebogo. So now I want to ask you a, a more fundamental question. So I want to ask you, ask you the following question. So here. And for this, we're going to go to the Bohr's model. And, you know, in, in, in the Bohr model, we have a, a, a nucleus, which is uh, positively charged. And we have an electron going into in an orbit, right? And the electron, as we know, is negatively charged. So for Bohr, we have than the hydrogen atom in quantum mechanics with Prof. Chaconte. So for this, uh, Bohr just basically apply that the, in an orbital motion, the centrifuga is equal to the centripetal forces, where the centrifuga is equal to, let's call it, uh, let's call it, let's call it F uh, centri centrifugal, and the other one is the centripetal, uh, but, but the, the fact of the matter is that this is mv square of r that's coming out, and the one coming in is z1, z2, e square, again, four pi epsilon naught r square, right? Basically, the Coulomb force equals the centrifugal force. In this case, the centripetal is equal to the centrifugal and the, to the Coulomb force, uh, which is attractive because you have a positive and a negative charges, right? So then, uh, Bohr, Niels Bohr, what he actually did was to quantize the angular momentum, and we know the quantum angular momentum is equal to r cross p. Um, as this goes in this direction, it's moving in a orbital motion. R and V, they have a 90 degree um, angle. So this will be R and V, right? So basically just by applying this formula, uh, obviously this is going to be N H bar. By applying this formula here, one and two, you reach to the energy of the orbit of the electron in that orbit, which is proportional to 
a factor uh, basically minus one over n square, right? By a factor of 13.8 EV or something, right? So I don't, I never remember the, the actual numbers, but, um, but basically there's a factor and then you have the energy of the different orbits n equal uh, one, two, three, right? And then you get the, the energy of the electron orbiting the nucleus. Um, and that's it. I mean, in a very simple way, almost in a classical way, just by quantizing the angular momentum. This is quantized here, right? Niels Bohr managed to get his model of the hydrogen atom, right? So this Albert Einstein call it the musicality of the highest spheres in the human thought in his little book called um, Autobiographical Notes. So this was quite a spectacular, but it's something that we can do ourselves in half an hour. And Ball got a Nobel laureate, a Nobel Prize, but the idea was incredible. The, the quantizing, quantizing the angular momentum manage and assuming that there's no obviously there's no uh, energy loss in the in the in the orbital motion which is uh, according to electromagnetism is not right obviously there were some weaknesses of this approach and i always like to go to hyperphysics because it's actually quite nice how explain things you know this you have the spectral lines and this spectral line corresponds to, to some energy levels and these energy levels are really transitions from, from the electron moving from one place to the other and emitting uh, radiation. It can be a, a, an X-ray radiation, right? And this is very nicely explained here, how you angular momentum is quantized, as Bo assumed. And basically, this is what we just talked talk before, that the centrifugal, centrifugal force coming out equal the uh, the charge, which is one in this case for the both, for the for the charge of the of the of the proton and the electron, and from there you can actually deduce uh, the energy, which is uh, minus thirteen point six z square over n square. So electron volts, right? So this was the energy, and uh, As we can see, the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom actually gave the same energy. So the Bohr model was helpful step along the way to developing quantum mechanics, uh, the quantum mechanics model of the hydrogen. And you know, here we have different wavelengths for the for the hydrogen atom because not everything is a circular motion. And here we have the failures of the model. You know. He fails to provide any understanding of why certain spectral lines are brighter than others. There is no mechanism for the calculation of transition probabilities. The Bohr model treats electrons as if it were a miniature planet, which uh, with definite radius and momentum. This is a direct violation of the uncertainty principle, which, which dictates that position and momentum cannot be uh, simultaneously determined, right? We all know this. So basically, uh, there were some uh, failures, but despite the failures, agreed, um, calculated the, the energy of the uh, electrons orbiting the, uh, the proton, right? So now I want to ask you guys, and I want some answers now. So, why do we need quantum mechanics? Why do we need to solve this particular problem? The uh, Schrodinger equation. If we, uh, we deduce already the energy of the levels 
So here, why do we need to use the Schrodinger equation? Why do we need to use quantum mechanics? And um, we can discuss this later, but I want you to think about this because this is fundamental in our, our approach, our next uh, step. We want to understand why things happen and why we use quantum mechanics to make things happen. So the I want to I want to see any any anything in the any answers any replies in the WhatsApp. I mean in the in the chat. So what do you think we use showing the Schrodinger's equation? You can unmute yourself and say something. Is that clear the question, guys? Anyone knows why we are using the Schrodinger equation for this particular case of the hydrogen atom or for any particular, any, any case in, in general? Why would, would we use the Schrodinger equation if, for instance, using um, some classical approximations here, we can deduce the energy of the electron going around the, uh, the nucleus? I think, Prof, uh, we use it when we want to find uh, the total energy. That's that's uh, that's good, but um, uh, thanks for the for the for the reply. That's good, but the total energy was determined here already. This was the energy, and that equation uh, provides us with energy. But it's very important to understand. That the Schrodinger equation provides us with energy, but also provides us with the uh, wave function, right? And the wave function has all the information that we can have of our system. And this information is only limited by the by Pauli's and uh, by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, right? So the wave function. So provides the functions provide all information about the system. So the energies are okay, but here using quantum mechanics and the Schrodinger equation allows us to get also the wave function. And the wave function, once we know the wave function, we can deduce how a nucleus, how a state decays to the next state, what are the probabilities for this to happen. We can apply all the quantum mechanics that we know, right? And we can deduce what is the, the position, what is the average position, right? If you have the your, your typical uh, X, T is dx, right? And you can deduce what expectation values. You can deduce more things than just the energy. So basically, it, it gives us power, scientific power, to calculate much more than just the energy. So that's why we use the Schrodinger equation. So our goal here will be introducing the shell model and calculate as much uh, as we can for the nucleus itself. So the shell model, we are going to have a system, which uh, we already discussed this a little bit in the, in the, in the deuterium. So we're going to have a system, which we're going to have a potential. This is R, 
and this is going to be our potential as a function of r and this potential is going to be uh, what we call a harmonic oscillator right it will go up and assuming uh, Hughes uh, formula the potential for this will be one half of kx squared in one dimension or v equal one half of k r square in three dimensions so now in our shell model this potential will bind our states of interest and as we shall see i'm just describing this in a in a in a gross manner because i think it's important so this potential will have equidistant energy levels and we're, this is what we're going to deduce ourselves. But there will be like two buildings. One building with equidistant floors. Actually, let's make it uh, this like a, a normal building with where you have floors. But uh, we're going to have one for, for protons and we're going to have another one for neutrons with the same equidistant levels. So basically, this is the ground floor. Is our ground state first floor second floor but this is going to have a uh, and um, the same thing i say here for neutrons right so basically two buildings with the same uh equidistant floors like we have most buildings you know we have a, a bunch of floors that we we are going to determine how many and these buildings they only have a a, a little issue that they will only allow particles or inhabitants the, in that floor, which are limited. The floor is limited by the by the Pauli principle. Basically, basically, uh, all particles, all protons, are fermions, and they cannot have they cannot have. Uh, have the same quantum number, right? The same quantum number. Right. So these are the limitations that we're going to have in our building. And we'll see later on that this building, uh, once we apply the spin orbit interaction, it won't be so equidistant. First floors we will shift and we'll move up and down. So it will be a, a kind of a crazy building. If this is uh, similar to to onion shells, right? So we have onion shells, but uh, and each onion shell is going to have as many particles as they are determined by the Pauli principle. So now we are going to solve, as we always do in quantum mechanics, the uh, Schrodinger equation. Energy this where this the Hamiltonian is equal T plus V, right? So this I want to say now because be, before I forget, because I want you to do lots of exercises. The your being must be full these days. It's very, very important that your your paper, your waste basket is absolutely full. So here we have uh, at the beginning we introduce the shell model. And I want you to read this carefully. Why there is a surprise, surprise. I want you to this we know evidence for the nuclear shell model. So we have uh, that uh, these uh, there are certain nuclei which are especially stable. Um, those uh, nuclei, they have particular magic numbers. They are 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, 126. And these nuclei with these magic numbers, they are particularly stable because it's very difficult to, to remove uh, to, for particles, for protons and neutrons to go to, to the next 
shell, there's an energy gap, and this energy gap is large. So um, stop, uh, you need uh, more energy for these guys to be promoted to the next level, to the next floor, right? So our next floor, according to the shell model, there will be a floor, you know, we have these equidistant floors, but once we open, once we have a, a magic number, the next floor will be much higher, right? It will be difficult for us to go up to the next floor because it requires more effort, more energy to go to the next floor because it's much higher, right? So basically, let's assume that we have a building, a strange building, and we are going to characterize this building according to the laws of quantum mechanics. So this harmonic oscillator potential is uh, described, as I, I just mentioned before, has some limitations. Um, these are, we, go, we, go, we get through this later, through the different uh, um, single particle energies. So you can see here that the energies of tin and lead, for instance, the, the, the first excitation is very high energy, the first two plus. So this is also a, a characteristic of, uh, of the shell model. Uh, what is the, here? So in nuclei, where you have a shell model, the next excitation, this is the ground state. Uh, we call it the first zero plus. And the next excitation is normally at first two plus, but the energy is very high. And this very high energy is an indication that the next level is, uh, or the next level here is quite high for this particle to be excited right there. So basically the, the, the building has a, a much higher flow suddenly and the particles cannot go up so easily. But before we do that, let's keep going through the basics. So the basics is the Schrodinger equation. We can apply a Taylor expansion because this is uh, a minimum at R equals zero, similar to the potential well, but in this case, this is the harmonic oscillator. Why do we use the harmonic oscillator? Is because uh, mathematically is a, a, a very uh, tractable uh, potential where we can determine what we're looking for relatively easy. And you're going to determine what we're looking for, which is only the, the wave function, right? The wave functions are crucial because at the end of the day, I mean, I'm talking, this is a, 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 a lecture where I am trying to give you the bigger picture, right? We're going to get these wave functions and every state in the nucleus will be described as a linear combination of these wave functions according to the principles of quantum mechanics. So now, this is K, but K, as you know, is the force constant, which is M omega square. So let me close this one. Oh. Right, so in this, uh, in this potential here, K is m omega square this comes from from waves from classical mechanics so basically we have a potential for hamiltonian which is t plus v so t is p square over two times m plus one half of k x r square let's make it a, let's do it in, in three dimensions k r square and uh, this equal to p square over 2m plus one half of m omega square r square, right? Um, here, we continue. This is the potential that we have, right? And once here, we are going to, uh, and here we have the orbits, as we say, where we have all these things that we're going to explain right now. So first thing for us to do is we are going to make a change of uh, variables, say, uh, we're going to change, we're going to introduce, to define the annihilation and the creation operators. 
This is what is called second quantization. And uh, Prof. Chaconte also told you about um, annihilation and creation operators. So basically, it's def they are defined as this. And assuming this, we are going to we are going to we are going to get the the, ten, the operators x and p as a function of a and a dagger. These are also operators. Everything everything is operator here, right? So we are going to define this guy. This is the annihilation operator, and this guy, which is the creation operator, and we define as as such, right? As such equations here. Uh, uh, such equations here, which let me just uh, make a little bigger this thing. We where we can have x and p as a function of a and a dagger. So now the the Hamiltonian can be decomposed once we have a x because here we have. Uh, oh, let's go back to the to the single to the one dimensional case. So you see we have P here and X here, right? So A will be as a function of such and such, as a function of X and P in a way, I don't want to tell you what is there, in a way that X is equal as a, and P is equal a, a function of A, A dagger. So X will be A, whatever, I want you to calculate all these things, A plus A dagger, and P will be A minus A dagger. Uh, let's write the square, uh, square root of two, and this some factors here, A minus A dagger. And here we have I square, right, uh, square root of two, right? So basically the Hamiltonian suddenly changes by using second quantization, the Hamiltonian change onto something much simpler. So we just substitute here what is p square and x square according to this new uh, new formalism that we're introducing. And you can see that h bar, I mean the Hamiltonian becomes uh, h bar omega, omega naught, let's say, over two times a dagger a times a dagger a plus a a dagger. Always with this hat showing that we know that these are operators, right? So now, now it's very important. Um, First assignment is already that is already assigned here. Very important that we uh, deduce this ourselves. The fact that a the commutator between a and a dagger is equal to one. Okay, this is assignment. Number one, and these are the question, the tutorial questions that we were discussing yesterday. And there are a bunch of them I want you to do. These days, full, full basket. Okay, full bin. Not only that, I mean, we can we are going to use the the, the fact that a uh, a um, a a dagger is equal to one we are going to use the uncertainty principle to deduce this. So basically, you know that this is A, A dagger minus A, a minus A dagger A, right? So you basically get the commutator and you have to see that this is equal to one because then you can put this here and deduce the final equation for the Hamiltonian, which is H bar omega naught, A dagger A plus one half. So then you're going to, uh, this is the continuation of what we are doing. This is another equation that we should be able to, to deduce a dagger a as a, this is the, the, the wave function. 
n will be equal to n, which is the, the total number, the total uh, harmonic oscillator, n equal to zero, one, two, three, and this is equal to two m plus l. Again, this is the, the end of the solution once we solve this, the Schrodinger equation. And you're going to get that the energy of the harmonic oscillator um, states is equal to h bar omega 2m plus l plus one half, which for the case of the 3D uh, potential, the 3D uh, case will be 2m plus l plus three half. So then now, now uh, we can see this table here. So basically another question is another assignment. Assignment is deduce the energy levels for the harmonic oscillator. So basically the another assignment number two is that n is going to depend on nl, which is going to be equal to h bar omega naught. And then we say this is uh, 2m plus l plus 3 half. 2m plus l plus 3 half in the 3D case, right? All right, assignment number two. They use this formula is more or less written in the in the in the in the lecture notes but it's not explicit so i want you to go step by step always no shortcuts step by step to reach the eigenvalues the the energies of the harmonic oscillator right so now we go to the beginning this are this are calculation that you have to do how to reach here um now we're going to go to the beginning. And uh, as you can see, n is equal to zero, one, two, three. So let's use that formula that we have here and see what, what it's telling us. So we have we have a potential. It looks like this. Goes to infinity. So this is not good. This is one of the weaknesses of the harmonic oscillator potential. So let's say one half of kx squared or yes, r squared in the 3D case. So now let's deduce from the energy. We're going to make a little table. The energy depends on the quantum numbers n and l. And we know it's h bar omega naught times n uh, 2m plus l plus 3 half. 2m plus l plus 3 half. All right. So then n can go from zero. One, two, three, and L will go uh, will go for we we'll go we we're going to the same zero, one, dot two, but in this case we are going to have a, a, a nomenclature. Zero, one, two, three, where this will be the S, this will be the P, this will be the D, this will be the F and so on and so forth, right? So this is going to be the labeling of our orbitals, as you can see right here, right? So not only that, but each orbit, which each, each, each level is going to have a parity, which we also know the parity is equal to uh, minus one to the L. So if the, we have a state with s equal to zero, so the parity will be positive. If we have a state with p equal to one, so basically, let's see, l is equal to s p 
P, D, F, G. So this will be the same thing as L, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? So this corresponds to 0, 1, 2. So the F, for instance, we have a, a negative parity. Parity will be negative because F is equal to 3. Um, minus 1 to the, to the 3 is obviously negative, right? So now, let's see what this all means. So let's go to the simplest case scenario where we have n equals 0, and let's make our table here. So let's say uh, n, l, and let's put here e and l. So let's say if, uh, if l is equal to 0, and l is equal to 0, E and L, the energy of the of that particular state, of that particular orbit, or that particular flow that we're going to put into our potential right now is equal to three half h bar omega, right? So this is our first guy here. We're going to have a state at n equal to zero, the harmonic oscillator. Uh, quantum number, which has n equal to zero and l equal to zero. And this has energy of energy equal three half of h bar omega naught. So now let's go to the next case is let's say we have uh, zero and l equal to one. So then we have zero here, l equal to one plus this guy, it will be five half of h bar omega naught. Let's make this, um, uh, and we continue. We continue here, and let's make it uh, one, one. So this um, will be uh, two, two plus, uh, Plus one will be three, six will be nine half. Let me see. Two zero. We can put. Let me see if we, what is the lowest one we can do now. One and zero. Right. In the table we can see clearly the different positivities that we have. So zero one also one zero. So. In the case of one zero, uh, here, instead of one, let's put it at zero here. So this will be two plus three half, this will be seven half, right? Seven half of h bar omega naught. So then we have here we have the different states. So we have n equal one, which has an energy of Pi half of h bar omega naught. Then we have h n equal to two. We have energy of seven half of h bar omega naught. And let's see what happens if we have uh, in the table one zero zero two. So the zero two. Zero two also will come with an energy of seven half h bar omega naught. And then these guys have been called L equal to zero, right? L equal to zero, which is S. And that's why they are called here zero S, because in this case, this orbit is characterized by. Um, by the uh, quantum numbers n and l, right? So this guy will be the, the zero s. This guy will be the zero p, right? Because as we see here, n is equal to zero and l is equal to one and l is equal to one corresponds to p. So we're going to label that as zero p, right? 
The next one will be one S and it will be the generate because the zero D has the same energy. Right, zero D because uh, we have again zero N and two which corresponds to D, right? So one here. So basically all these guys are being characterized by NL, right? So we have a way to label all these different states and we can continue, we can continue here, but we see that each one, each different jump in energy is characterized by a, a jump in H bar omega naught. And this is our building for proton and neutrons. We are going to have one for protons and one for neutrons. Basically two buildings where we're going to allocate the different, um, the different proton and neutrons living on these floors, right? So what is the next condition? The next condition, as we mentioned before, is uh, uh, Pauli's, Pauli's uh, exclusion principle, right? And Pauli's, Pauli's exclusion principle tells us that the occupancy, which is here, in this, uh, this is the occupancy of the floor. So it tells us that we have two, six, S, uh, two here. For the D, we have 10. For the P, we have six. So basically, it tells us that what is the occupancy of each floor? will be equal to uh, one half of 2L plus one. Let's see if this is right. So say for L equal to zero, the occupancy will be L equal to zero, uh, one half, actually there will be two of this. For L equal to one, uh, we have two, five, five, no, this is not to be, uh, let me see, it's not one half here. It's just two L plus one. So times two. So let's see. So if we have L equal to zero, the occupancy is two uh, times two. Let's see whether we can make the formula for the occupancy. So L equal to zero, here we have two. So let's see L equal to one. We have two times one, uh, two plus one, uh, three times two, six, right? L equal to one, the occupancy will be six. Uh, for L equal to two, the occupancy will be two times two plus one, five times two, 10, right? And these are the number of protons uh, and neutrons that they can be accommodated into uh, these particular flows. So put it in a, in, a, in, a, in a way, this guy, 0s, we have we come with two protons. The zero P, which is L equal to one, will come with six of those. And this uh, zero one, I mean one S, the S will always come with two. And the D, which is um, two, we have, we come with 10. One, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. All right. So these are the inhabitants per flow, number of protons and number of neutrons in these particular energy levels. So two protons here that necessarily they have to be with a spin up and a spin down. Now let me remove this so much, the size of this uh, writing. And the same thing for all these guys, they will up and down, up and down, up and down. And basically, that will be our occupancy, which we also be determined by, uh, but how the particles are oriented in space, because as we know, L equal to one corresponds to ML equal minus one, zero, one, right? So pair for L equal to one, we have these three possibilities. And this comes again from quantum mechanics. These are the, the different orientations for L equal to one. These are three, right? But as the, the, the spin can go up and down, we can have these three times two. Still always obeying Pauli's um, Pauli's um, exclusion principle, right? So these are the variants and the possibilities that we have. And then we have a flow. Uh, we can write it down here where the next number will be two inhabitants. Then the next one will be two, uh, six, which will add to eight total. And then eight, one, two, eight, nine, 10, plus 10, 20 total. And we we'll keep going up there to the same equidistant levels. But right now, I want you to look at this. Another assignment is what is the next number here? Assignment. Okay, there are many assignments now. I want you guys to uh, to do all these things. What is the next number here according to our, our simple model? So, but so far, I want to tell you one thing. 2A20, which we just use here. 2A20, actually it's here the next number. So I, I, I want you to get the next number. So eight, 2A20 um, if we go to the beginning these are actually the magic numbers right so we have reproduced somehow the first magic numbers by using a harmonic oscillator which is an indication that we are on the right path so thanks and again, we explain the meaning behind this is that um, those nuclei with these particular numbers, but these particular magic numbers of occupancy. So for instance, we have two, right? So let's say protons. These two guys. Um, here we have the same thing for neutrons. So with two guys, so this will be the zero S, right? This will be the zero P. Here we say that these fellows is the one S and the zero D according to the different possibilities. This is the energy jumps here. But you can see these energy jumps are quite large. Large, So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So if we combine these two buildings together, so that will be uh, 
one, two, three total is eight protons and eight neutrons. So that will be 16, eight, eight. So this will correspond to oxygen, right? Oxygen, oxygen 16. So if we have something like this, this will correspond to helium-4, two protons and two neutrons, right? So this particular nuclei, if we add, keep adding more here, this will be another magic number, eight. And the next one will be 20. And the whole thing, the whole thing, once we add the 20, uh, actually not the 20, because we already have eight, so we have to add two plus 10, 12, 12 guys here, and 12 guys here. Right, there must be 12 and 12. So then we have that this whole nucleus will be calcium 40, which is also a magic nucleus. 20 protons and 20 neutrons, right? And they are magic because they are particularly stable. You know, the, the first excitation is quite high. From the ground state to the, to the next excitation, there's a big gap of energy, which is not always the case. Um, in most nuclei, uh, without magic numbers, we don't have this. And we have prepared our building, our floors with uh, inhabitants, with people, living on those floors so we have for this particular case we have for this building we have only two protons living here two neutrons living there here we can have up to six up to six and because uh, remember that p is equal to one um equal to l here and for one ml can be equal to minus one uh, zero and one and this each one has a spin up and a spin down. So the occupancy of the P is going to be six. That's why we have two times uh, two L plus one, right? That's the occupancy of all the inhabitants here. Here we have the, the zero S, actually the one S. One S and zero T. They are the, the generate because they all have seven half of h bar omega naught energy for n l where n is equal to uh in this case is either zero and two or one and one they got they, you got the same the same energy so you have this uh, degeneracy so with that we have closed the loop and tomorrow we're going through into the mathematics so this is very important to see the concept, to visualize what the shell model is, to visualize this strange building where only a few, a few particles or a few inhabitants can go in each flow, according to the Pauli principle. Uh, D, for instance, in the case of D, D is obviously two. So two, you have the possibilities of ML, minus two, minus one, zero, one, and two times two because each one can go with the spin up and down so the same we never have the same quantum numbers so we're going to stop here because there's a lot of information i want you to go through the video and ask for uh questions i'm going to stop sharing